Today's scripture is from 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. You must understand this, that in the last days distressing times will come. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unfeeling, implacable, slanderers, profligates, brutes, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the outward form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Good. It's good to see you. Welcome to those who are new here today. I want to send a special welcome to you, as well as those who are watching online for the very first time. We are starting a new sermon series today, and we're going to be talking about the topic of boundaries. You know, we experience boundaries across all different areas of our life. There are boundaries that are about relationships. There's boundaries about finances, about time, and there's even spiritual boundaries. Boundaries, And so we're going to have an opportunity this month to talk about each of those. Today we're going to talk about relational boundaries and what that means from a biblical perspective. But before we dive in, let us go to God in an attitude of prayer. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed today, that we may hear with joy what you say to us. And the church said, Amen. Have you ever stopped to think about the number of boundaries that we experience in a given day? I mean, take for example a simple trip to the grocery store, some place we all need to go to, right, to get food. So it starts in my house as I decide, well, I'm going to go to the grocery store. And so I go out into my garage and I get into my car and I encounter the first boundary. What do you think that is? Seatbelt, right? I'm going to put that seatbelt on. It's a boundary that I want around me in case I get in an accident to keep me safe. It's also a boundary that our state of Missouri has set a law that we need to wear those when we're driving or riding in a vehicle. And so that's kind of the first set of boundaries that I encounter. But I don't know about you, but as I leave my house and I pull down the street, eventually I come to another boundary, right? I come to a boundary that is this red sign here which sets a boundary that I need to stop, right, so that I don't run into somebody else who maybe is coming the opposite direction uh, on the street that I'm turning on to. I look and make sure that uh, it's all safe before I make my turn. And I don't know if you ever had this experience, but it seems like no matter how quickly I want to try to get someplace, and especially if I'm in a hurry, I hit every single red light. Have you had that experience? Yeah. Right? It's like... Any red light that could happen, it's happening. And it kind of teases me, right? Like I'm kind of getting up to it, and then it turns red. And it always happens when I'm in a hurry. So when I finally get to the grocery store, I've gone through these boundaries. I've gotten past all the red lights. Oh, gosh, the boundaries must be over now, right? Well, not quite. You see, at my grocery store, there is handicap parking. There is veteran parking. There is pregnant mom parking. There is order pickup parking. And I think there's even an employee of the month parking spot. Those are all really good things, except I don't fit any of those categories, and I'm just trying to get in and get some groceries. So I eventually go to the clergy parking spot at the grocery store. <laughs> I wish, right? I wish. There's no clergy parking spot. Uh, but eventually, I do find a parking spot. It's usually like five miles at the very end of the parking lot and I proceed to make my way to the entrance. Now, at the, the grocery store that I go to, it's not just a single door. They have an entrance door and an exit door. So again, there's another set of boundaries, right? Like, I need to go in the entrance and out the exit. If I do it the other way, it's just going to mess everything up. So they have an entrance and an exit. Genius! Genius, I tell you, right? So then I get in the grocery store, and I have another kind of boundary that I encounter. I have to pick my cart. Now, they have, in my grocery store, they have these large carts, 
But then they got these smaller little kind of buggy carts, and I love those. I call those the zippy carts because you can kind of like turn around people and get around the corner. And I like to drive like Mario and Dreddy at the grocery store, so I'm kind of going around to get things. And, um, and so I decide, well, maybe I need some lunch meat, right? I need some lunch meat. I'm going to go to the deli counter. And you know what? I encounter another boundary because I can't just go up and be like, yeah, give me two pounds of ham. No. What do I encounter? I encounter the tickets. The tickets. You know, they're like, I take a ticket, it's like number 12, and they're hauling out these numbers, like 12, 13. It's kind of like red bingo, right? B12, B13, right? So I get my lunch meat. I go get some other things. I decide, well, I need some hamburger. I need some hamburger. And so I go to the hamburger aisle, and then I see one of the packages has one of those bright orange stickers. Do you know what I'm talking about? means it's on clearance. Why is it on clearance? It's old, it's about to expire, and they have this boundary that they can't sell expired meat, thankfully. So I buy that because I get a good deal, and I'm planning to cook the hamburger that night. And I decide, well, okay, I got my hamburger. I think I'll finally start to head for the checkout. And I'm heading for the checkout, and then I see it. Oh, I see it, and it's, it's such a good day because my favorite soda, Cherry Pepsi Zero is on sale. It's on sale for an unbelievably low price. I'm so excited. I'm like, well, I'm going to buy like 10 cases of it. And then I see the four words, the four dreaded words. You know what those are? Limit three per customer. And I think to myself, where are my teenagers when I need them? Because they could each check out three and we could have nine of them if we had the whole family, right? It just... There's limits, there's boundaries everywhere, it seems. Finally, I get to the front checkout, and I don't know if you've been to a store lately, but they keep adding all these self-checkouts, and then they have the full-service ones, and there's like probably 10 or 20 full-service ones, but how many are actually open? One, maybe two, if you're lucky. And the line for them is like the line at Target the day after Christmas, right? It's super long, because people are trying to return things, but it's super long in the grocery store, But then I look up, and there's like, I don't know, five or six in the self-checkout lanes that nobody's at, but they have this sign, 15 items or less, and I have about 20. So what does your God-fearing pastor do? I go to the self-checkout line, and I pray to God for forgiveness later, right? I just try not to make eye contact with the customer service attendant. I'm kind of like, I'm just going to do my business. But then I get to the cashier, you know, the uh, self-cashier register, and it says start. So I press start, and it says, this machine only takes credit. Would you like to proceed? Okay, well, that's fine. I don't really carry cash. I can do that. So finally, after all these boundaries, I get checked out. I get everything loaded back in my cart. I head out to my car, which, remember, is parked five miles away. I unload everything into my cart, and then I go to return my shopping cart, my little zip beer buggy here, right? And what do I discover? There's two different lanes in the cart corral, one for the big carts, one for the little zippy carts. But somebody, not to be named, has put their zippy cart on this side and a big cart on that side. They did not follow the boundaries, but grace abounds for them. So I fix that, put everything in the way, and all is good. Whew, all that to go to the grocery store. I share this story, friends, to illustrate the point that we are surrounded by boundaries. Amen? Some boundaries we recognize, other boundaries we don't. Some boundaries we like, some boundaries we don't. Oh, I forgot to tell you another boundary. My wife does not like it when I go to the grocery store without a list. Because she says that I put things in the grocery cart that we don't really need. Let me tell you, don't tell her because she's sitting right over there, I don't like that boundary very much. (laughs) But boundaries are all around us. Friends, ultimately, however, even the boundary about the grocery list are designed to help us. They're designed to serve a purpose, a purpose that helps us to be healthy and safe in our lives. And you know what? Even God has boundaries. We look at the Bible and scripture after scripture defines the nature of God. God says that God is distinct and separate from creation. There's a boundary there. 
that, that while God is one, we also know that God is part of the Trinity. There are distinct boundaries between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, on a more personal level, a more human level, boundaries define what is me and what is not me. What is me and what is not me. And, and it defines kind of what is um, part of our responsibility in life and what is not part of our responsibility. And what do you think is the most basic physical boundary we have? Any ideas? Our skin. Our skin is the most basic physical boundary that we have. It defines what's inside our body and what is considered outside of our body, and it protects and holds everything together, right? As we age, it doesn't do as quite a good a job of holding everything together, but it holds everything together, right? Now, when we think about relational boundaries, the most basic boundary is the word no. The word no. No. And when it comes to relationships, friends, no is a powerful boundary because it informs others that you are in control of you. People with poor boundaries, you see, they struggle with using the word no or, or even saying not now. People with poor boundaries also have difficulty coping with, with the pressure and the control or, or the demands and the needs of other people, especially when they come from family or close friends, right? We have a hard time saying no. Now, in today's scripture, the Apostle Paul is, is writing this farewell letter to his dear friend, Timothy. Timothy was kind of like his protege, and Paul's believed to have written this from prison in Rome. Um, Paul believes that this is probably the last letter that he's going to be able to write to his good friend. He anticipates that his execution is just around the corner, and so he wants to write one last correspondence to Timothy. And, you know, as we heard uh, Lauren read for us today, he says, people will be lovers of themselves, they will be boasters, they will be arrogant, they will be haters, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And that's all good and fine, but what I want us to pay attention to this morning are the very two last words used in this scripture. Do you remember them? What does the Apostle Paul tell to Timothy, say to Timothy, about those kinds of people? Stay away. Stay away. Avoid them, he says avoid them, right? Talk about a boundary, right? And that, my friends, is one of the most important lessons that I hope you hear this morning. When a relationship is harmful, when a relationship is hurtful to you and to those you love, many times the only way to set a healthy boundary is to create distance or to create space between them and you. Now, I've had to do that with some people in my own life, and let me just tell you, it's not easy. If you've had to do that, you know it's not easy. And I've grieved the loss of the relationships, those relationships where I've had to create boundaries and create space. I have grieved the loss of some of those relationships, and I've even been accused of being unkind or uncaring. But my friends, hear me. Boundaries need to come with consequences. If you set a boundary and then allow people to trample, trample over it time and time again, you really haven't set a boundary. You really haven't said no. And so boundaries need to have consequences for those who would cause you harm. And while in my situation, it's been one of the most difficult decisions of my life, I can see now looking back, because there's been a while since that boundary's been in place, that I am a better husband I'm a better parent, I'm a better father, because I have distance between me and the toxicity of some of those other people. So make no mistake, setting a boundary can be challenging, it can be difficult, it can be downright hard. And why is this? Well, you see, as humans, our basic need is for connection. Right? We need connection. As I've preached many times up here, we were created to be in relationships, right? 
And the unfortunate truth is that so many people choose to stay in unhealthy relationships, even when the other person is manipulating them or abusing them, whether it be verbally or emotionally or even physically, or just simply treats them like a doormat, right? They choose to stay in these relationships, and you sort of look at it, and you're like, why? Why would they choose to do that? Well, well, you know, why don't they create a, a boundary and, and kind of get out of that situation? Well, here are some of the most common reasons why people stay in unhealthy relationships. I invite you to listen to, and to consider if, if any of these might resonate with you. Number one, they're afraid of how the other person will react if they set a boundary to protect themselves. Right? You want to set a boundary, you want to protect yourself, but you're worried about how the other person will react. And let me just say, if you haven't learned this lesson yet, you do not control other people's feelings, behaviors, thoughts. The only one you can control is you, right? Right? Number two, we're afraid of how others around us will react if we set a boundary to protect ourselves. What might they say? What might they say about us and our relationship with that person that we've set the boundary? This might be coworkers, this might be other family members, this might be friends, right? Number three, we're afraid of maybe experiencing guilt or shame because we've waited so long to set a boundary. You know, sometimes you're in relationships and things start off really good, really good, right? But then slowly, kind of year after year, things kind of decline. And before you know it, you're in this unhealthy relationship and, and you just, you feel like a shame now because now you're like, okay, I need to say enough is enough, but I've been doing this for so long, I don't know if I can say no now. I don't know if I can set that boundary. Number four, we've learned that how we're being treated is not normal, healthy, or, or, okay, or okay. Friends, let me tell you that you are created in the image of God. And so many of us, if we've not had the example of how to be treated in a healthy way, don't know any different. We think that that's how everybody gets treated, and I'm here to tell you that is not normal. That is not okay, and it is not healthy. Number five, we have forgotten that we are beloved children of the living God, and because of that, we are worthy. You are worthy of love and respect. Amen? Amen. Never forget, friends, that each of you bear the divine image of the Creator. There's a piece of God in each of us, right? And so we are worth being protected. We're worth being safe. Number six, and this kind of, I think, sums up all of them, and it's at the heart of why so many people have a hard time setting boundaries. It's because they're afraid. They're afraid of being alone. We think if I set a boundary, if I tell the other person no to protect myself or to protect those that I love, that they'll leave me, that they'll end the relationship. And sometimes that can happen, but your protection, your health, your safety is worth every bit of it. Now, I want to take a moment here just to, to say to everyone in this room, as well as those who are watching online, if you are in an abusive relationship now, there is help. There's help available to you. You can reach out to me, you can reach out to Pastor Diane, you can reach out to others here in the congregation, or you can reach out to the Nas National Domestic Violence Hotline. You'll see the number here on the screen. They also have a website where you can go chat, or you can text the word START to 88788. The point is, is you don't have to stay in an abusive relationship. You can set a boundary, but you don't have to do it by yourself, okay? Now, Christian authors, Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend, wrote this best-selling book called Boundaries. And anybody here read this book yet? Okay, a couple people. Well, it is one of my favorite books. Hey, man, good job. It is one of my favorite books. If you haven't read it, I can't encourage you enough to check it out from the library, get it online, do the audio book, or you can even borrow my copy. It is one of my favorite books. And one of their key points is that boundaries help you be in control of you, right? Boundaries define that the, the things that we are and the things that we are not, the things that we are responsible for in this life and the things we aren't responsible for. And in their research, these authors found that being in control of you means taking ownership, 
taking responsibility for several key things in life. And I just want to quickly share a few of those and see if they resonate with you. First of all, being in control of you, setting healthy boundaries, means that you control your attitudes. You control how you look at something, whether you kind of take a, a, a negative look at it, right, or whether you take a positive look. You control your behaviors. You and only you control how you behave. You can't put that on anybody else, no matter what they've done. At the end of the day, you control your behaviors, what you say or what you do. Being in control of you means you control your values, right? The things that you assign importance to, the things that you give value to. Being in control of you means you set boundaries and you control your limits. How long you are exposed to something or sometimes someone. Anybody have someone in their life that you're like, okay, I can take them in short doses, right? There's a reason for that. You are setting a boundary, whether you realize it or not, where you have said, okay, I can, I can continue the relationship, but I need to limit or manage the time that we spend together. Being in control of you means that you control your talents, right? Or how you use your God-given abilities and skills and gifts. Two more. Being in control of you means you control your thoughts, a lot of times we don't realize that, right? We control our thoughts. We have a choice of whether we want to, what I call, be in a state of stinking thinking. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where it's like, right? Or do we want to look at something from a more positive lens and count our blessings? We actually can control that. You can change your thoughts. You can change your thoughts. And finally, your desires. We control what our hopes and what our dreams are. Right? We have control over that. And so of all this list, I want to say that you know, these are the things that we are in control of, but that also means the opposite is true, right? You are not responsible for other people's attitudes, for other people's behaviors, and other people's values. Now, I know some of you like to try and like to act like you're responsible for other people, right? But at the end of the day, you're not. All that's going to do is get you upset, frustrated, resentful, and exhausted, right? You control you, and they control themselves. So let me say this again. You are not responsible for other people's attitudes, behaviors, or values. And I want you to know that when I finally learned this lesson several years ago, and, and I haven't perfected it, but when I finally learned it, it was like this huge burden had been lifted off of my shoulders, you mean I don't have to worry about controlling other people? I don't have to worry about meeting the needs of everybody else? No. You know what? That's God's job. God is the one that makes sure that the earth keeps spinning. I don't have to worry about that. That is a huge relief. So church, my prayer today is that you have or you will have this same discovery in your own life. Now, Dr. Cloud and Townsend, they devote a, a chapter of their book to talking about boundary myths, things that society or we as humans think about when we think about boundaries that just aren't really true, okay? And I want to touch on just a couple of them briefly today. Number one, if I set a boundary, I'm being selfish. Myth number one. Actually, friends, healthy boundaries increase our ability to love and care for others. You see, church, when we set boundaries, we're able to bring our best selves our rested selves, our healthy selves, into a situation where we can serve and equip other people. You know, we can't do our very best things when we're tired, when we're exhausted, when, when maybe we become resentful or bitter because we haven't had a break, or, or we're just going through the motions because it just seems like this is all we've been doing, right? You see, our lives are a gift from God. Do you believe that? Our lives are a gift from God, and so if they're a gift from God, when we say no to other people and other people's behaviors that are hurtful to us, we're actually protecting God's gift. When you say no, you are protecting God's gift. That is your life, right? Number two, the myth of if I set boundaries, I'm going to be hurt by other people. Is it possible? Is it even likely that others will become upset? or maybe angry with us when we set a boundary, or, or maybe they might even attack us verbally or disengage from us. Of course. People don't like to be told no, right? We live in this kind of yes culture where we want what we want, when we want it, how we want it, and boy, we often want it now, right? 
We like to be told yes. And so, you know, Cloud and Townsend explain that when we set boundaries, boundaries are really kind of a litmus test for the quality of the relationships that we have. They're a litmus test for the quality of relationships that you have with other people. Because if you set people, if you set boundaries for the people in your life who love you, who care about you, they're going to respect those boundaries. They're going to honor those boundaries. Now, on the flip side, if you set boundaries for people in your life and they choose to ignore them or push up against them or, or attack you, they're revealing that the only thing they really care about is your compliance, your obedience to their expectations. So the point is, you and I can't control how other people are going to respond to our boundaries. We set them anyways, right? When we set boundaries in a relationship, it's either going to strengthen the relationship or it's going to reveal that maybe that bond, that friendship, that relationship was not as strong as you actually thought it was. But friends, setting boundaries is always the right thing to do. Myth number three, if I set boundaries, I'm going to harm other people. And let me say, boundaries are never meant to be used as a weapon. Never use a boundary as a weapon to hurt somebody else, right? To the contrary, boundaries are meant to protect our mind, body, and soul. And that, my friends, is a good and holy endeavor. You know, throughout the Gospels, we read story after story where Jesus was in his ministry and he is feeding the crowds, he's healing those who are, who are injured or ill. And what does he do? Does he stay there and help everybody? No. No. He withdraws from the crowds, and he goes and he prays to God. So do we think Jesus was cruel because he didn't stay in a particular town for, you know, six months to make sure everybody got healed? No, right? Jesus knew that he needed to withdraw, to rest, to be in communion with his Father, and the same is true for us. When we set boundaries, we are much able, more able to be our best selves so that we can help other people. And the beauty of the church is that when we get tired... When we get exhausted, when we need to set a boundary and say, okay, hey, I need to take some time away or I need to uh, rest for a little bit, the beauty of the church is that we're here to support one another. So there should be another person that's ready to step up and help continue the mission and ministry of the church while we rest and we recharge. Myth number four, boundaries mean that I am angry, right? Boundaries don't cause us to be angry, church. Rather, anger is a sign that our boundaries have been violated. Now, people may accuse us of being angry when you set a boundary, but that's really just them projecting at us, right? It's natural to become angry when we're being manipulated, when we're being harmed in some way. Drs. Cloud and Townsend explain that anger can actually energize us to want to protect ourselves, to set boundaries. And that said, though, they say that you have to work through that anger. That if you don't work through that anger, if you don't talk through that anger and, and kind of resolve that anger, it will live inside you. It will fester and kind of rot in your heart and soul. So as we start to develop and uphold healthier boundaries in our lives, we're going to have less of a need to be angry because we're going to get used to telling other people no or not now. And they're going to get used to us setting boundaries that protect our health, our mind, body, and soul. And finally, number five, when others set boundaries, it harms me. Someone else set a boundary that affects me. And, and I know that having to accept the boundary of somebody else can feel unpleasant. Like I said, we're used to kind of being told yes. We live in a yes culture. And we don't like to be told no. However, I think there's a difference between feeling uncomfortable or unpleasant and truly being harmed or injured. Right? And so when other people set boundaries, we have an opportunity to, to pause and to ask them, tell me more about that boundary, to kind of listen for understanding, help me understand what your needs are and why you're setting this boundary. Because throwing a temper tantrum, being like that two-year-old who didn't get their way, does that ever work? No. That just harms the relationship further and we really just look foolish at the end, right? So church, God has given us lots of examples in the scripture 
from Jesus to the disciples to so many other people where God has set boundaries, where God has modeled boundaries. And when we learn to set healthy boundaries for our lives, for ourselves, for the one and only person that each of us can control, that being us, we are that much more able, I think, to be the people that God created each of us to be. And that, my friends, is some really good news.